First of all, there wasn't uh, uh, motion pictures, they were silent pictures, and uh, I didn't know about that. And uh, also, we didn't have radio, we didn't have television, we didn't have the mediums we have today, and I was just so interested in uh, learning how to do things uh, like dancing and singing and uh, uh, even the acting part of it hadn't entered my mind yet because the dancing, I wanted my ballet teacher, Miss Kalanova, mm -hmm. I wanted to be perfect. I wanted to be able to do the ballet dancing in an Al White's dancing school. And of course, I was younger than Matthew and the young people who met me today, Jimmy, <laughs> and uh, the tap dancing and the soft shoe dancing and everything. And I was so interested in doing it the way they wanted me to do it and being perfect in what I was doing that fame or, or becoming anybody important I just wanted to do what I did very, very well, as well as I could. And it, when I did it, I was very proud of that. I had a certain pride in it, you know. But as far as um, going on and on and on, no, I think at that age, I, I couldn't uh, entertain think that kind of thinking. I think my mother did, but I didn't. <laughs> Long before Blondie, you became involved in the world of entertainment. Would you share with our audience what happened prior to 1938 when you began the Blondie series? You were very active on stage, and uh, uh, your career already had achieved uh, a notable amount of success. Yes, I had, I had been very lucky, and I had been making gains in uh, musical comedy and gains in uh, uh, the Broadway extravaganzas at the Winter Garden. While I was still going to professional children's school, I started in vaudeville when I was about six or seven years of age. And that's a pretty early age, you know. And of course, in those days, uh, the children in the theater, especially in vaudeville, which was a kind of family entertainment. Now, when I say family entertainment, I mean that what you saw on the stage was always very, very uh, excellent and entertainment and it was always geared to the families because the families were the ones who patronized the vaudeville houses so we never had to worry about something being off key in a vaudeville show of any kind uh... however with the children uh... we would uh... we would be in these uh... little kitty acts uh... kid cabaret and things like that now my, in my act there was a milton burrell and raymond guillon and uh... Uh, and myself and some of the uh, children from Philadelphia, uh, Dolly Truxus and uh, Margaret uh, Langhorn, and oh, a whole lot of us, you know, that you probably would never know their names. Um, from Vaudeville, uh, I went into uh, the Schuberts. I was signed with the Schuberts. My parents signed the contract because they were my guardians and I wasn't of age. And uh, from the Schuberts, I graduated into uh, Schwab and Mandel's Good News and then followed through. And I co-starred with uh, Jack Haley, who was my friend for over 50 years. He died recently. And the Haley family, we'd been very close for over 50 years. And so uh, while all of this um, success was going on and I was making my mark, I was so busy uh, working and being happy and enjoying what I was doing, that it never occurred to me that uh, there was any kind of fame. I knew I was getting billing. I was working for that. We work for that, and we're very proud of that. Billing is when our name is out front and in which position it's in, and that's sort of our rating. That's a performer's rating, like a child gets a report card, A, A, B, B, C, C, you know. And uh, if you're F, you're N company. <laughs> <laughs> But anyway, uh, I don't know, of course, I'm talking about a kind of show business that used to be that is no more. It's entirely different now. The children of the vaudevillians would take over, but uh, when they were in their tender years, they would either be in a convent or in a military school while the mother and father were touring along the way in vaudeville and then they would have a break and they would come home for several weeks and they always tried to be home for the holidays or have the children with them on tour for the holidays. But I was very lucky because as part of my tuition to the woman who took care of me in the act, because my mother couldn't travel with me, 
my mother I had a sister and a brother and she lived here in Philadelphia and uh, so she couldn't go with me on the road so Mrs. Call would take care of me and Mrs. Call had Susan Bud Call her son and daughter in the show and uh, he did imitations of Joe Frisco and Pat Rooney and I was the understudy for that and sometimes when Bud, Bud Call was sick and I had to fill in for him and do my own numbers too. I was bumping into myself in the wings, getting changed and getting out in time to do Pat Rooney Jr. and uh, Frisco. But anyway, uh, I would get into the theater early in the morning because I had to take care of the, um, the wardrobe and straighten out the dressing rooms. I had to earn my way, you know. You don't get anything for nothing. You have to work for everything. So I would earn my way by getting to the theater and I would see that the... Um, the boys' pants and costumes were all pressed and the jackets were all nice. And I would uh, wash out the things that would have to be washed out, like the socks or the hose or whatever we were using for the girls, and press the costumes and hang them all up, and they'd all be nice and fresh. And we used to go to the 5 and 10, and I don't know whether you remember, they used to have little white canvas sandals at the 5 and 10. <coughs> and they had kind of a white patent leather heel. They were like Mary Jane's with the straps, you know. And uh, they had the white patent leather uh, uh, over the, it was like oilcloth, over the wooden heel. And we used to get uh, a bottle of gilt, a bottle of silver, and we used to paint the canvas so that it would look like Silver Kid or Gold Kid because we couldn't afford to buy Gold Kid or Silver Kid dancing shoes, you know. And then we had trouble getting it to stick on the patent leather, so we used to cut the patent leather off and just paint over the heel. But I had to make sure that the cracks, because when you were dancing, uh, it would come off like uh, little bits of puff smoke, you know. So it just had to, it had to watch the cracks, and you had to scrub them with the brush so that you didn't get too much, so that when you were dancing, the dust wasn't flying all over the stage. <laughs> so it was during those periods when I would get into the theater in the morning and get everything set up that I would meet the other performers and the stars on the bill who would come in to get their mail. Now the uh, husband and wife act who would have a daughter in a, a convent or a son in a military school, they lavished on me all the attention that they would lavish on their own if they had them with them. So I was taken out to lunch and I was taken out to dinner and they made costumes for me. And of course I was supplying the whole act with all varieties of costumes that were made for me. I couldn't wear them all, you know. But inside of about a two months tour, say I would have about five costumes that these women would make for me, you know. Well, they were shared, they were in the act, the other children in the act, the other girls wore them too, you know. And that was quite a saving for us. But I have to tell you about the children's acts. The children's acts were like the dog acts. They were always the opening act, or the second act, or else they never put the children on to close the show, because that would be too late. So we were either on first or on second. And uh, it was always the desire of every child in vaudeville, the Mecca, the temple to play when you were in vaudeville, which was before musical comedy, by the way. Musical comedy didn't come in until the 20s, I think. And uh, it was the ambition of every child who was talented, who was in show business, to play the palace. That was the theater. If you played the palace, oh, that was the greatest thing that could ever happen to you. Well, one day Mrs. Call and the women in the act received a call from Folly Marcus, who was an agent for the Kid Act, and he said, I want you to get the children ready because they're going to open at the palace tomorrow. Well, I'm telling you, we were so thrilled and so excited about opening at the palace theater. What had happened was the dog act was sick. <laughs> so they had to get something very, very quickly, and so they decided they would put the Kitty Cabaret on for the opening act. Well, I'm telling you, we went out and we were so nervous, but we were so proud, and the audience loved us because six, seven, eight years of age, you know, all these little tykes, and you know, and we were singing modern songs, and uh, we had our own little dances and things, and we were so professional, you know, we would bow to each other and bow to the maestro, and we had been taught very well professional etiquette. That's also a lost art today, but we were taught that, 
And so uh, everything was fine. And we were so thrilled. And we thought, oh, and we were telling everybody, come to the Palace Theater to see us. Two days later, the dog act was better. And we were out, and the dog act opened the show. <laughs> I know I've gone by way no, of Kensington to answer your question. That's perfectly all you right. You know, Philadelphians really love to talk. <laughs> yes, they do. From stage to movies. Uh, well, th that that was kind of an accident. I didn't go from, uh, well, yeah, yes, I did go from the stage to the movies. But uh, the elders in the business, after musical comedies and... Um, you know, and vaudeville to musical comedy. After musical comedy, uh, the elders in the business said, now, Dorothy, you really have to uh, do, get some stock experience. You have to now get some polish and learn how to be an actress. And so they suggested that I take a, a, a spell in a, with a good stock company. So I did. I went up to Iverton, Connecticut, Milton Stiefel Stock Company. I picked out the best one because Katherine Hepburn had, had experience up there, Margaret Sullivan was up there, Henry Fonda was up there, Blanche Yerka. There were a lot of the outstanding uh, stars in live theater who were going into motion pictures who had served their apprenticeship up at Iverton. So I went over to see uh, Milton Stiefel, and it seems that he had had uh, a couple of people who had been in musical comedies up there the season before. So when I went in to see him, and the appointment was arranged through some friends, uh, he said, oh, yes, Dorothy, he said, uh, musical comedy. I said, yes. And, but I said, I would like to know how to become an actress now, and I would like to get some professional experience and polish. And uh, you have the best stock company, and uh, I hope that you will let me uh, participate in it. And he said, well, he said, I don't know. He said, um, musical comedy. He said, they're always ready to go into a song and a dance. And I said, well, uh, I said, I won't do that if you'll help me. So anyway, he, uh, he said, all right, all right. And I was getting kind of nervous because it didn't seem that the interview was going so well, and he didn't want anybody who had been in musical comedies, you know. He was obviously had had some troubles with them. So anyway, so uh, he said, well, he said, everybody reads, so he said, you read. So he hand, handed a book over to me. And I looked at it, and up at the top it said, Alien Corn. And I didn't know, it rang a bell, but I didn't know what it was. But it was a black page, we call a lot of print, and a long speech that, that's all printed out. We call that a black page. That means that's a long speech. Well, this was several pages long. And so he said, uh, did you, uh, he said, read that for me. And so I said, all right. And I didn't know what I was reading, so I just started to read. And I thought, oh, it's going on and on. And I looked over at him, and he had his feet up on the desk, and he was back with his eyes closed. And I thought, oh, he's going to sleep, you know. But I kept on reading and reading. <laughs> and finally, I got through the two pages and turned the page. And he said, uh, his feet came down, and he said, did you see the play? And I said, no, I never saw the play. And he said, uh, well, he said, that was Catherine Cornell's big speech in Alien Corn. Now, I'm Irish, and I'm from South Philadelphia, so I jumped up, and I said, well, that's fine. I said, you call Kit Cornell on the phone and ask her if she'll come over here and do the varsity drag for you. <laughs> I, thought I, had, I thought that I had really, you know ruined myself and I started to walk out and he said no no wait a minute Dorothy wait a minute so I stopped and he said uh, that was really pretty good he said uh, yes he said I think you'll be with me but Henry Hull sent me a woman uh, and I told her she could be the leading lady her name is Hala Stoddard and Henry Hull of course at that time was an outstanding uh, legitimate performer and he was a big star and so uh, he had sent this young girl, Hale Stoddard, and, uh, to be the leading lady for Milton Stiefel's Iverton uh, Players. So Milton said, uh, you're both excellent. And he said, you'll both read for the same parts, and whichever one is the best will get the part. And I said, well, that sounds fine with me. And I met Hale, and I thought, oh, I probably won't get any of the leads up here. But I did. I was his leading lady for the summer. And I was very proud of that. And the experience was excellent. Now, while I was up there, talent scouts from uh, Hollywood came. 
and uh, they they talked to me about going to Hollywood. Well, I wasn't too sure about going out to Hollywood because I had been out there after Good News mm -hmm. with Irving Thalberg. I had a personal contract with Irving Thalberg, mm -hmm. and uh, I was out there and I did uh, I did Good News, and I didn't like motion pictures. I like the live audience, and I still do. I still love a live theater audience. It's so gratifying, and it's so wonderful. And you're not stopping every two seconds for a redo or a, a reshot of a, a scene, and you don't have to do it over and over and over and over again. So, and I guess I missed the applause, too. So anyway, so finally they convinced me. They talked me, and Howard Dietz came up to see me. And Howard Deet sent me out to uh, California. And uh, funny, uh, I didn't have clothes with me. And Hale Stoddard let me borrow some of her clothes. And uh, I had the flu when I got on the plane because uh, they wanted me right away. And fortunately, the show I was in was closing that up at Harrington, you know. So they wanted me right away. And so I got on the plane, and I had this awful flu with the running nose and no makeup and the watery eyes and the beanie cap and everything. I had no idea what they wanted me for. It was for After the Thin Man, <laughs> opposite Jimmy Stewart and Alan Marshall. And she was a very glamorous nightclub singer. And I showed up, and Howard Strickland from MGM was out there with Parsons and all the press. The new find is coming out to do the picture. You know, Howard Beat sending a new star out. And I got off and I had a fever and I, I just looked like a, a little doggy that nobody wanted, you know, anything but glamorous. You know, I, I could see the faces, you know. And when I went in and met the producer, because they took me right to the studio, you know, when I went in and met Mr. Stromberg, he had a little bit of a twitch. Well, he had more of a twitch when he looked at me. <laughs> he was a wreck. He said, oh, well, uh, 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 he said, Howard, Howard Deeks sent you out here. He said, I can't understand this. And he said, well, go up to wardrobe and everything. I said, well, I don't feel very well. But anyway, they sent me up to wardrobe. I went into makeup and I made a test that evening. And the test turned out beautifully. And so I played Polly in After the Thin Man. So that's how I got into pictures. Then I came back here. I'll re-clip you. So I really lost her. Okay. There we go. Then I came back here because I wanted to go back into um, live theater again. But then I went back out to California and I did a few other pictures and then I went over to Warner Brothers and did um, Swing Your Lady, Humphrey Bogart's leading lady. Can you believe it? <laughs> First time he kissed a leading lady on the screen. And it was a very small part for Humphrey too, you know. Louise Fazenda and Nat Pendleton and Alan Jenkins. And that was the first country music song of Old Apple Tree in the Orchard with Elvira and the Weaver Brothers. And I did Hillbilly from 8th Avenue, all apple songs, all tree songs. And, um, and so then after that, I did a few other things at Warner Brothers. And uh, then along came the Blondies. My agent took me over to Columbia and I tested for the part of a young housewife and a mother with Eddie Quillen. Mm. And I did not know I was testing for Blondie. Nobody told us what it was for. It was just a young housewife, you know, and I had dark hair. And, but I was in the kitchen ironing, so I said, well, if I'm going to be ironing, please put the iron in so I can go like that, like we do in Philadelphia, wet the iron, you know, and then iron a little bit. And so uh, everything was working and everything was fine. And then I received the call to come in and the, that I was doing blonde. So then I became a blonde. <laughs> so that's the whole wretched Nobody story. Nobody <laughs> Nobody expected that the film itself would generate a series or the amount of popularity that it did. My husband produced the... I wasn't married to him at the time, but I married him, uh, the producer of the Blondies. He had the idea to make the Blondies into a series of films, but they didn't know how successful it would be. So they made the first one, and Harry Cohen, the head of Columbia, he couldn't understand it. He thought it was the worst thing he had ever seen. He said, it's, oh, we're, we're, all, we're bankrupt and we're, we're spending more money on this. And he wouldn't even come in after the first day's rushes. He never came in to see any of the morning rushes. So we went ahead and made it. We made it in three weeks, and I think it cost something like a hundred and some thousand dollars, $175,000 to make the first blondie. 
and Columbia was really financially, they were really into bankruptcy. $175,000 in 1938. That's right. And three weeks to make the picture. And so um, they took the picture out to Pomona. We all went out to Pomona to see the preview, and the walls came apart. The audience loved it. And it was so exciting, and they were so thrilled, and uh, the cards were wonderful. When they got back to the studio, Harry Cohen, the head of the studio, didn't believe it. He thought somebody had rigged the cards, and he was furious. And so uh, he decided he would take the film out, which he did. So he took Violet from the cutting department. He took George Side, the head of the cutting department. He took Mars Doloff, the head of music. He took everybody with him in his limousine. And he took the film, and he went off someplace. And we knew he was taking it, but we didn't know where he was taking it. And the same thing happened, and he came back to the studio, and then he sent me a very lovely car, which I sent back to him immediately, because I kept my little Ford. I like that better. <laughs> 1938. Oh, and that's a, excuse me, Bob, but the Blondie films were not included. Harry Cohen did not put them in the sales um, papers. They, right. The exhibitors could not buy the Blondie films from the sales sheet. And after the first Blondie was previewed, and they knew that they had a hit on their hands, and they were going into the next Blondie, they were able to move uh, Angels Have Wings, all the big productions that they had done with all the stars that were not box office successes. The exhibitors had to take one of those before they could get a Blondie. But the one they bought was really the Blondie. Then they got the other at a cheaper rate, you know. And the, the Blondies uh, pulled Columbia out of bankruptcy, $12 million dollars the first six or seven weeks that the first Blondie was out. How does it feel when you're part I of I didn't that? make that money. Oh, I understand. <laughs> I understand that. But to be responsible for something. That, well, it wasn't just me. I, I realize it's, that. You know, it's never any, any one person. A one person can be an inspiration. But one person doesn't do everything. It has to be cooperative. It has to be something that everybody does together. That's when you have a big success. Did you, if it was for the family, was the production unit, the performers especially, were you also like a family? We sure were, and that's what was picked up by the camera. The camera's a very strange thing, as you have taught your children, I'm sure. The camera magnifies. It picks up on things. It measures a person's intelligence. You can see them on the screen. I shouldn't be saying this because sometimes the shots are so terrible of me <laughs> that <laughs> I shouldn't never, be giving never. away secrets. <laughs> but no, it really does. And uh, for instance, there are great stars in the live entertainment world. Ethel Merman absolutely sparkled on the stage. She was great on the stage. She with the camera, the magnification of the camera lens, that it could, it was too much. Her personality was so big, it could never be caught by that camera lens because it would magnify it and would get distorted. So she was never the big success in films that she was on the stage. That's happened to a lot of people. A lot of people who are not successful on the stage are simply fantastic in film because the camera magnifies and gives them a bigger personality than they have in real life on a live theater. We had the same crew and uh, all of the uh, extras and people who worked with us. Uh, we were all kind of a big family. We were very professional. We were on time. We knew our lines. And uh, we were very patient. But we were uh, a family-oriented group. And that was picked up by the camera, that, that happiness and that there was nobody trying to outdo anybody or trying to reach, uh, get ahead of somebody to have a more success than somebody else. It was all working together. And of course, when they'd walk on the set and they would see uh, Baby Dumpling and Alvin and Daisy and Bondi and Dagwood, you know, it was just like walking into your own home. Everything in the kitchen worked. When we had breakfast scenes, I would cook the eggs and the bacon for the, the grippers and the juicers up on the scaffolding all around. They'd say, coming up, uh, easy over, Blondie. I'd say, okay, Fred. And we'd have the toast and we'd have coffee, and uh, that's just the way it was. And the Blondie Bumstead home was not a great big palace. It was a home. And uh, people could come and walk through. They finally had to prevent 
the audience, the public, from coming in to watch the blondies being shot because they would ruin the shoot, the shooting, mm -hmm. the shots because they'd laugh. Steve, how many, from 1938 until about 1950, right. how many films in the Blondie series were made on an annual basis? Well, there are 28 that were released. Uh, in the early years, I think they made three or four of them a year. Three a year, yeah, and then we went to four right. a year. Uh, there were really more Blondies right. made than have ever been released. Mm -hmm. I don't know who has the others. What? What kind of a production schedule were you involved in, though, Penny, to, you know, Today we talk of a of, of a single feature taking two or three years to complete. Here we're talking about a series that generated two or three films and sometimes four in the space of a year. How long did it actually take uh, to make an individual blondie? Well, if you're going back to the uh, the origin of um, uh, the writer and the producer and the director and the location, the unit manager, uh, sitting down and starting a Blondie picture. They have an idea. The writer writes it. The location man, they break it down. They have to have locations. So the man takes his scout and they go out for locations. They find the location spots. They break that script down. For instance, it's not done in continuity. Uh, if there are uh, five or six scenes in, uh, in the kitchen, say uh, one is a breakfast scene, one is a dinner scene, one is Blondie cooking something and she has to run the front door. They will shoot all the scenes that are to be shot in the kitchen at that time. So that's the only way that I can tell you that uh, it was all set up. How much time did it take up. you? Four weeks, six weeks, two weeks, three weeks? What? For, uh, when you were involved for, to, to make your contribution to a Blondie? We would shoot for three weeks. I see. And uh, the, my work that would all it. be over. <laughs> yes, uh -huh. but we knew our lines when we came in, you know. What kind of a day, for example, how, how many hours? Is it nine to five, something? No, like I had to be at the studio. I had to be up at five o'clock in the morning. Five o'clock in the morning. And I had to be at the studio because, the, I swear, Helen Hunt, the most wonderful hairdresser, but I said, Helen, you're only taking one or two strands of hair at a time. She would wrap these things because Blondie had the curls, right. you know. Oh, I got so tired of those curls and all the wrapping, you know. So that was done, wet, you know, shampoo and wet, and then go under the dryer and then get the makeup put on, which didn't take too long, and then get into your wardrobe, your, you know, and then have your hair combed out. The hair took, that's the thing that took all the time. And uh, and then you had to be on the set at 8.30 for a run-through, and shooting started at 9. And you were done for the and day? And we were, we were done for the day. The children were done for the day earlier than we were. Mm -hmm. Because in those times, uh, they were very careful about the children. The children could only work for so long. They had to have a rest. They had to have a certain length of time for their uh, food. They had to have a, they had a teacher on the set. They had a doctor and a registered nurse. Everything was set up for those children. Those children were just treated beautifully. They were never abused. And everybody loved them, you know. We spoiled them rotten. <laughs> but it, I don't really mean that, but I mean they were really given every consideration. Everybody loved them. And so uh, the children would go earlier. Sometimes if we had a, a shot that would, uh, with the dog, that would take a little bit longer and um, Alexander or the, or the children, sometimes they might go just a little bit past, but they would never go past any longer than five or ten minutes. And then that would be golden hours and the mothers would like that. <laughs> You know, that would be a little extra something for them. I see. But they never took advantage of the uh, children. What kind of a time, though, for yourself? When would the day come to an end? When would you actually walk out of the studio? Oh, I'd get out of the studio, I guess, about 7, 7.30, go home. And, and then you would still have lines to study mm -hmm. and, and be on deck at 5 and 5. Well, I would have lines that I would be brushing up on. Um, because usually the moment I got my script, I read it and studied it, and I knew everybody's part as well as my own. Mm -hmm. I studied the lines. Did you come to enjoy movie making, or still deep down inside, uh, you still preferred working on stage in front of a live audience? My preference is a theater, live theater, live stage, yes. And, uh, but I'm very grateful 
to the movies, I think I have a lot to be grateful for. Now, our boys and girls are able to appreciate your contribution through motion pictures. One of the areas that they're a little hazy on uh, is this whole thing called radio's golden age. And you were a part of that as well. That's right. Um, the, the Blondie series was not only something that we shared in movie theaters, but you also performed on radio. That's what can right. you tell us about what you remember? The medium? Yes, The please. difference in the medium? Well, I think I've, I've told you about the making of pictures, the camera and the sound and the shooting, and uh, that uh, that's the technique for making the pictures. The technique for radio was entirely different because there you didn't have anything visual. Radio, to me, is one of the strongest and one of the the best forms of entertainment that ever existed because a person could do the washing, could do the cooking, and you could still be following my friend Bill and all the, what they called soap operas on radio before they became soap operas on uh, TV. But you could follow all of those things, but yet you could be doing something. Now, when you're with a TV show, you have to sit there and watch it. You know, you're glued. You become a captive to that little box. But with radio, uh, we would come in and we would have a read-through, and then we would get stand up to the mics, and then we would have a run-through with the sound effects. We'd read it through, and then we'd stop, and our sound effect man would come in, and then we'd have the orchestra that would come in, we'd wait, and then we'd get the cue, go, and then we'd pick it up, and we'd start talking again. It was a wonderful, wonderful medium. But you had to be on your toes, and you had to be uh, pretty quick on the... Uh, the responses and uh, the timing had to be just so, you know. Not that it would be fast timing, I don't mean that. It wasn't always fast because uh, some timing, the early Blondie radio shows are very slow. You know, oh, Dagwood, you know, they're so quiet. That's the, that, that was the culture at the time. Mm -hmm. You had a different kind of timing. Mm -hmm. uh, now everything is very fast and very, uh, you know, whoa all of that stuff, you know, which is all right, I guess, but uh, I think that um, we're changing. I'm, I, I, I think the pendulum is swinging backwards again, you know, and I sure hope so because I think it was much better as it was than as it became and as it is right now. So, um, Take a drink. Um, water? Yes, indeed. Good. <laughs> <laughs> That's my speed. <laughs> Unfortunately, it's mine too. <laughs> <laughs> but um, but your your radio, uh, we had wonderful performers on radio. Mrs. Dithers was Aggie Moorhead, mm. and Hanley Stafford was Mr. Dithers, and uh, uh, Jim Backus was there. Uh, we had all these wonderful people who later became stars on mm -hmm. television. Bea Benadaret, you know, she was. Uh, on my own radio show after Blondie, the Penny Singleton show, uh, she was my housekeeper. And, oh, I loved the... Oh, Mrs. Williamson. <laughs> <laughs> and so... Uh, so but um, professional people, some of them become very impressed with their success and their talent. Uh, and that's all right, too. I'm not being unkind about that. But the majority of people with the real talent, the majority of people who achieve great success and lasting success are those who are very simple and very, uh, very calm about things and very grateful for what happened to them and for their talent. So I look for the people who are like that. And sometimes I worry about being a disappointment to people when I meet with them because I think maybe they would expect me to be like some of the, the stars that I've read about. Well, I couldn't be like that if I tried. I don't even think I could play that kind of a part. <laughs> you know, but, uh, and an actor should be able to play any kind of a part. But that would be the kind of a part I wouldn't be interested in. Where does your energy come from? 
Well, it must have been something in the water in South Philadelphia. That's the only thing I can say. <laughs> That's what we're trying to find out. Oh, are, are, are well, I was a dancer. Coming? No, I was a very strenuous dancer. Now, the other day, the other night on uh, with with Jim um, uh, Jim Mc, what was his name? The uh, uh, man on radio. McCormick. Jim, Jim McCormick. McCormick yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, Jim McCormick. I had my one of my dancing teachers, Miss Florence Kalanova of the Kalanova School of Ballet. She was one of my dancing teachers. She taught me ballet. She came down. I called her and said, Miss Florence, please come down. I want you on the radio show with me. And so she came down, and it was so good to see her. But you see, I started out as a dancer, and I had a good, healthy pair of lungs. So I was just kind of a, not a trained singer, just a singer. And so uh, the dancing, I think, the strenuous exercise, the acrobatics, I trained with um, Professor Walter J. Herman. I was training for the Olympics. Mm -hmm. And uh, I wanted to uh, get the gold medal if I could. I was, that's what I was working for. I didn't know if I could or not, but I was working for that. But I was one of the fastest acrobats in the business. Now, and that's I something think, I don't think most of your fans realize that uh -huh. you were involved now, in. You remember Steichen, the cameraman? Mm -hmm. Steichen? Sure. He invented a lens. He came to see me at the Winter Garden. I was the propeller in a number. I was in Sky High at the time, and the chorus formed an airplane. And I was the propeller on that airplane, and I did what we called spotting tinsicus in one spot. And I did a hundred of those in one spot. I would do 50 with the hand, without the hands, and then I would do 50 with the hands. And uh, he came to see the show, and he was so impressed because he said, oh, you can see her arms and legs. I've, I have to get a picture of that girl. And so he invented this lens, and I went up to his studio, and he had it on, and it was on uh, 41st Street and uh, off of Fifth Avenue. And he had a room like this, and he had a, a place for me to do the spotting tinsicas. And he took a picture of me with it, the first time that lens had ever been used. And that picture was in one of the early issues of Vanity Fair, which was a very classy mm -hmm. uh, uh, fashion and society magazine. And there's a full page saying, uh, with, uh, taken by Steichen, and the first time that lens had been used. He used the lens that could stop something, and he could, uh, while it was in motion, you know, and he could get the full thing. And, of course, he was one of the greatest cameramen we had. Mm -hmm. He left a lot of things. And I never did get another picture of that. My folks did. You know, three moves is as good as a fire when you're traveling around and moving all the time. I don't know what happened to scrapbooks and old pictures and things. I have some of them, but not as many as I used to have. Are you getting set now to put your memories down on paper, as it were? I'm writing a book. And I said, uh, it's not going to be the kind of a book you've been reading. Uh, with a lot of sex and a lot of this and a lot of that. It's just going to be a book. I don't know whether it's going to sell or whether it isn't going to sell. But I'm going to do it even if it's for nobody other than my grandchildren and my own family. Have you started? Yes, I have. And it's like Topsy. It keeps growing I and just growing and I keep remembering uh, things. And I <laughs> say, I'm, never, I'm not, not going to live long enough to finish it. Oh, suppose we uh -huh. give... Uh, our other guest an tell opportunity. Me about, yeah, and tell me about your children. I whatever. will indeed. But uh, with us is uh, Steve Randisi, who is probably more informed about your career than even you may be. And I have been really impressed with the fact that uh, when he latches on to something, um, he becomes a one-man research department. What I'd like to especially to share with our kids is uh, where your interest developed. And I would really appreciate it if you would tell them the story about the little boy who didn't want to go to bed. Oh, and, <laughs> well, uh, all I know so much about Penny is simply because I'm a Blondie fan. And, you know, the thing is that the kids today are so sophisticated. When I was six years old, I thought the Bumsteads were real. I remember asking my parents, you know, where do Blondie and Dagwood live? I wanted to meet them. And, of course, you know, children today who see movies, you know, they see things like Superman 3 and Rocky 3. And I suppose when you were making Blondie, uh, 
if it had been the success today, they probably would call it Blondie 1 and Blondie 2 and Blondie 3 and Blondie 4, rather than, you know, the sequel titles that they use, like Blondie Meets the Boss and Blondie Brings Up Baby. But speaking of Blondie, I brought some photographs. Maybe you'd like to see some of them? Certainly. And I think Penny could probably illustrate these the best. Okay, you, you want to play to this camera? Sure. Can you see these? I'll just hold them up. And Penny, can you see these? Yes, I sure can. Hi, Dagwood. <laughs> You want to tell the audience what these are? Uh, this is uh, Blondie is whispering something to Dagwood. I don't remember what I was whispering. Uh, but that's a close-up of both of us. Was that the first Blondie? Yes. That's the first Blondie picture. All right. The first Blondie that was made. Okay. This is also from the first Blondie. This is also from the first Blondie. Oh, you're going to tell the story about this one, aren't you? No. The chair, later. And this that's is Blondie, here. Blondie talking to Dagwood. And here's Baby Dumpling, wasn't he, darling? Aren't he sweet? And Daisy, and what a dog that Daisy was. Honestly, that dog tried to talk, you know, really tried to talk. That dog was so lovable and so sweet. And, of course, all the puppies. We had a ball making these pictures. It really wasn't work. It was work in a way, but it was the most pleasurable kind of work anybody could have been blessed in having. So that's the little Bumstead family at the time. Later on, we had Cookie and six puppies. Well, speaking of Cookie, there she is. Yes, here she is, Marjorie. Is that cute? And there's Larry and Margie. There's, he was called Baby Dumpling when he was little. That's right. And then when he was about seven years old, um, in the first grade, I think, uh, Blondie took him to school. And uh, when he came home, he had a black eye. <laughs> and Blondie said, oh, Baby Dumpling. He said, don't ever call me Baby Dumpling. My name's Alexander. He'd gotten a black eye because they had made fun of calling him Baby Dumpling. So he had had a little bit of a joust with somebody. And from that point on, he was called Alexander. The interesting thing about Daisy is that she was trained. I should say he. Daisy was yeah. actually a he. Uh, oh, yes. Daisy was trained by Rudd Weatherwax, who also trained Lassie. For yes. Sakes. Oh yes, Rudd is a great uh, one of the greatest dog trainers out there. All the dogs and animals, you know, uh -huh. Rudd is uh, in on that, and the horses too. You know, he has beautiful horses. He sure you know? does. Yes, exactly. Uh huh. And, what, and the, the final one. Oh, the final one. Yeah, this is uh, Blondie and Dagwood and um, Alvin, Danny Mumbert. Remember the little boy next door, uh -huh. the one who was always giving Dagwood the um, fresh kid, the nervousness. <laughs> and here is um, Alexander. Alexander, yeah. Da is Daisy in there? Oh yes, Daisy's in there. Uh -huh. What was that? that he's reading from, something. He's reading a poem. That's from Blondie Goes Latin. You're about to take a trip on oh. a luxury liner, and he's reading a poem. I think it's. Um, let's see if I can remember it. Um, Whenever the Bumsteads take a trip, I always hesitate and wait, and that's because the Bumsteads seldom get ever beyond the Bumstead gate. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's why. Yeah, that's good. Good. I remember that's that. <laughs> he remembers it. Isn't that something? Well, I just amazed myself. I don't know. Yeah, isn't that absolutely dazzling? Yeah, 1940. How about that wasn't that? even born yet, but I have that. I have a part uh -huh. of that film, so that's why. Oh you know. uh, well, it. Families, the audiences could re could relate to the uh, Blondie movies. There are very few new movies today that audiences can relate to, you know. And uh, uh, I think the outer space. Uh, well, I did Jane Jetson, the voice of Jane Jetson, and um, and uh, my my grandson. You know, he's. He was so excited about this Sally Ride. You know, I'm excited about her too. Isn't that wonderful? The first woman in space. But I said, well, I said, you know, I was really the first woman to live in space <laughs> on film. <laughs> and of course, my son, my grandson, Matthew, he'll be 11 in September. Uh, he says, he invites his friends in, you know, he says, come on over to my house and we're going to see my grandmother. She was in the olden days. And she's going to have one of her old films on, on TV. <laughs> so, what was it that... that for you was so fascinating. Why are you such a Blondie fan? Well, Personally. I think it's basically because of the family element. You know, the Bumsteads live on Shady Lane Avenue and they have the dogs and the kids and, you know, the white picket fence. And it's really, watching those movies is almost like taking a lesson on how to be an American. Well, you know, the comic strip, it is a bit, it is... It's so uh, American. Yeah. Blondie is Americana. Right, exactly. Chick Young, it was the uh, foremost uh, comedy strip in, in the country. 
and uh, it became the foremost comic strip throughout the world and today it still holds that position. It is the foremost comic strip throughout the entire world. And Chick Young was a modern Mark Twain. And we followed the comic strip. We stayed with the comic strip like you stay with the Bible and your religion. Exactly. We were very faithful to the comic strip. And we never had anything that would be objectionable. We had slapstick. But you, you got a lot of real good, healthy laughs because it had to remind you of people in your family and things that had happened in your family, and it was all good, clean comedy. Sure. Anybody could go and see a blondie and not be insulted or, or have a bad taste in their mouth, and the children loved them. If it, have you had an opportunity uh, in the past couple of years to see any of the folks who were part of your movie family for such a long time. It, 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 the folks who made the Blondie films, are you ever oh, yes, an opportunity yes. to see Arthur Lane? Oh, yes, yes. As a matter of fact, I talked to Arthur. Arthur was supposed to come out here and uh, play with uh, Wayne Rogers and uh, Elaine Joyce. He was supposed to uh, play one of those little vignette parts in uh, uh, a dinner theater show called Catch Me If You Can. But uh, he's not going to do it. Uh -huh. He decided he wouldn't do it. And, um, and Arthur and I were supposed to uh, do the gin game over at your uh, City Line Theater over here. But um, he's not quite up to that part, he didn't think, you know. And he, he would like to do something a little different, you know. How about yourself? Oh, I will do anything on stage. I, I will do gin game. What I want to do is on Golden Pond with John Carradine. <coughs> I'd like to come out to City Line and do that. And I'm going into New York. I'm going to uh, find out about a couple of plays my agent having me see some people about there. They wanted to know, well, what does she look like? She's been around for a long time. What does she look like, you know? So I said, well, I'll let them go in and see what I look like. Maybe it will help. <laughs> That's fantastic. That really so there you are. But you're not slowing down in the least bit. I guess not. <laughs> We're having trouble keeping up with her. Oh, she's here this week, I should say that. Well, they made me promise that I would not run over schedule. You I are, bet we did. Uh, uh, a did little we? bit. Uh, oh, let me, isn't that let me awful? Have something for you. You want to bring these over here? I think it was so nice of all of you to come. It was such a big surprise, and the children are so... Oh, am I going to get this? This is... Uh, I have something for you and something for Steve. First of all... This little book here, Penny, yes. uh, believe it or not, it's the first time that anybody ever wrote something that dealt with Sinekid. And in, in buried in, in these professionals, some of whom you may know, is a little mention of this Willow Grove operation. And oh. this is a book inscribed from us to you with our oh, love. isn't that nice. And the same thing for you, Steve, with <laughs> our inscription and our well, appreciation for getting me ready for this. Thank you very much. And for both of you, oh. you walk out of here, oh, official <laughs> members of... Wait till I tell <laughs> real people about this. There you go. <laughs> How about that? Isn't that wonderful? Thank you. Well, we thank you. Thank you, Jim. Thank you, Matthew. Thank you very much. Oh, that's wonderful. How about that? And I appreciate your coming. Oh, well, the, I am so, so I am so pleased to be here. I did want to meet this young man, this Bob, and his children. I, as I told you, there is nothing else like Cinekid anywhere in this country. And you protect it, and you stay with it and develop it. Because when it begins to get around, you're going to have all kinds of poachers coming in trying to pull pieces away from you, you know, so you protect it, and I'll be right there to help you anytime you need me. God bless you. <laughs> okay. Now, now, you're not the only one who came with the gift, who brought a gift. Where's my gift? Um, Roger. Roger. I brought back a film. Whoops. Oh, excuse me. That's all right. It, it's a little, um, it was, my husband was the executive producer on it. And uh, it's Miss Helen Hayes and Kachi Girado. And, uh, well, you'll see it when you run it. But I brought it back for the children to see. It was a film that was made for television. Mm -hmm. And uh, I think that they will enjoy that. And then I have 
I have another short reel. Do you want to leave the short reel for the children to see? We need that for the banquet tonight. Oh, we need yeah, that for the exactly. banquet. Can you get it back over I for sure Bob can. afterwards? I sure can. All right, and then you'll see some singing and dancing. It's not great, but it's it's all right. <laughs> but um, but you can see that, and you can see how people start out in the business. Now, how old are you? Nine. You're nine. Well, I was a couple of years younger than you when I started out in the business. Isn't that something? Isn't that amazing? Gollies. And I've never known anything other than show business, except for one time when I got involved with the union. <laughs> and that was an experience. That's in the book. We won't go into that today. Okay, let me okay. take your clip off. Thank you, Bob. Oh. Thank you. Thank you very, very much. Thank you.